had a little bit of technical issues here. Let me just reintroduce Alan so that everyone knows who he is, what we're talking about. Um, so if you saw our live stream uh, earlier in the week, you already know me, I was on there. So um, I'm Danielle from the BCO SciComm team. Welcome everyone to the Black Rock Castle Observatory YouTube channel. We do post a lot of our activities here that we do around the castle and some work that we do in the observatory, which um, is really spearheaded by this man that I'm joined uh, with today. This is, this is Alan Giltonen and he is our resident astrophysicist and telescope expert, which is why he is with us today. We'll get into that in a second. If this is your first time here, first time joining us, go ahead and subscribe to our channel. That way you won't miss out on the videos that we put out. We put out a lot of different content here on the channel. And also if we have live streams, you'll also be notified about that as well. So um, Alan here is joining us because we have we're celebrating Hubble 30th, which is the 30th anniversary of the Hubble Space Telescope. And like I'd mentioned earlier, I, I do remember being in school. I remember seeing these images coming out. Um, I would just remember being a kid and looking at really like colorful, abstract photos that we had never seen before. It was really impactful for me. I remember, um, remember seeing those for the first time. And um, in our, our previous live stream, we talked a bit about um, the the impact that space travel has and astronomy has from space looking back at earth and so this time we're going to be talking about sort of the reverse the opposite of that we're talking about looking deep into space and looking far beyond far beyond earth far beyond our solar system and um, the achievements that hubble has really um, had in the last 30 years so um this is Dark Skies Week as well. And we talked a little bit about the, well, a lot about the, the effect that light pollution has on observing and on telescopes here on Earth. And what that, what's that, what that is doing for not only amateur astronomers and astrophotographers, but also uh, the real science and getting into um, uh, observing into the large telescopes and the large observatories. So we'll be talking a bit about that as well. And uh, we'll go over some of the technical, the differences between the telescopes here on Earth and why space telescopes were important. So I will turn this over to you, Alan, if you would like to explain a bit about Hubble and the history of Hubble and um, get into why it even was a thing. Why do we even use Hubble and why, why was this mission even created? Absolutely. Thank you, Daniel. Um, so Hubble itself was, um, it, it's interesting that you mentioned dark skies because uh, it, it was conceived in the 60s when um, there was consideration around uh, the atmosphere and how our atmosphere re restricts our, the ability of a telescope, uh, in particular an optical telescope. Okay, so we're talking about an optical system. Yeah, mm -hmm. So visible light, not radio light, because there, there, there are different frequencies. So Hubble is a, is, is, is a um, it does infrared, it does op, uh, visible light, and it does ultraviolet light. But it's quite a constrained system in that sense. Um, so um, we, we were, as, and I'm, by, by the, when I'm using the word we, I mean as a community, the yeah. astro community, we were considering how we might um, improve resolution um, and improve um, uh, the data quantity and quality uh, that we were uh, taking. So one of the best means of doing that uh, is to actually eliminate the atmosphere in the first instance. Best way of doing, eliminating the atmosphere is to go above it. Yeah. So, um, so hence and this is, is why you have... Sorry, 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 I didn't mean to kind of cross you, but I'm saying this is why you have observatories at the tops of, of mountains and things, because the higher you get, the less atmosphere you have, so. Absolutely, yeah. The, 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 the most, um, if you can eliminate as much of the atmosphere as possible, then you end up getting better quality images. Mm -hmm. um, from, and, and from an astrophysics point of view, that's important. Um, so the Hubble telescope itself, um, you know, was proposed in, in approximately 1969, 1968, thereabouts, it was, it was around that era. Uh, 1974 got funded um, by NASA and then the European Space Agency also came in and was um, a, in, an instrument contributor 
uh, to the system. So they put in a number of the gyroscopes and the imaging systems and some of the technology behind the system. So it's a kind of a joint NASA and European Space Agency program. Mm. Um, got launched in uh, obviously January 24th, hence today. Actually, in I don't know how many seconds from now, but we're, we're saying 12, April, not 12, January. 24, April. 12.24 in April 24th, yeah. in our time, it got launched. So yeah. it literally, it was, at the moment, it would have been in countdown mode, 24, 3, 2, 1 type stuff. Like right now, um, yeah. And, on, and that got launched on the Discovery mission, uh, STS-31. Uh, um, so uh, uh, it, it got deployed a day later um, on April 25th. Uh, so, hey, 12.24, it's launched. Yay! Yay! Um, <laughs> so on April 25th, it got deployed from uh, the Discovery uh, Space Shuttle. Uh, it, it takes, you know, it obviously, because you need to get into certain orbits, um, it's, so it's, it orbits at 600 kilometers uh, away from the Earth. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it takes time to obviously achieve that type of orbit and it needs to be a stable orbit because what you don't want is you don't want it either drifting off or you don't want it coming back down mm -hmm. um so uh so to achieve a stable orbit it, it takes a period of time and then after that once it is deployed uh it takes about a month to to kind of what's called spin up to, to so to get all of the instruments up and running and to get communications and so on, it takes about a month. So on, on the 20th of May, thereabouts, um, uh, first light, what's called first light in astronomy terms, which is literally the first image that you get back from the telescope, uh, was achieved. Um, now, uh, there was unfortunate around first light. Uh, there was a bit of an issue with, with, with the mirror, with the primary mirror, unfortunately, um, but that got fixed in, in a secondary mission. Um, so they, and they ended up basically putting in a small telescope within the big telescope to fix a, a tiny, there was a tiny bit of curvature on the primary mirror that was slightly off, um, but a, a, a secondary mirror, which was basically a reverse of the primary mirror, put, uh, if you put that in, in basically in the, the, the path of the light, um, that that actually fixed the problem. So um, so there was this kind of a secondary. So there's actually two telescopes in Hubble. There's a big Hubble telescope and there's a secondary fixing telescope. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 just look at what the images it's producing. Uh, they're fantastic. Is that so? I, actually, I'm not really familiar actually with the structure of the the Hubble telescope um, in general. But since I have my telescope behind me here, um, so the telescope is actually the smaller one actually inside the the main tube of Hubble? No, no, it, it's it's actually, it, it's slightly after, it's slightly underneath. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, it, it's, it's, it's slightly removed from the telescope itself, but what it does is it fixes, so you, you get, you get um, spherical aberrations and coma, so you get, you get optical um, deformation, uh, so optical error um, with the primary mirror, but there's mm -hmm. nothing that can be done about that. Yeah, that, that, I mean, the only way to fix that would be to actually grind it up in space. That's not going to happen or to bring it back down to Earth. And that's not going to happen. Yeah. So uh, so the only way to do it is to actually um, is to fix the optical path uh, of, of, of the light itself. Uh, and that, that can be done either in the primary system. So you have a primary mirror, which is your main mirror. And, mm -hmm. and just just for those watching, uh, Hubble is a 2.4 meter, uh, so it's a two meter class telescope. Um, so think of uh, someone who's you know six foot six. That's that's literally the primary mirror. That's how tall the primary mirror is. That's what, and that's in a radius. So that that's it's a it's a reasonably sized mirror. Well, just for for reference, this one's a six inch. Yeah. So the primary mirror, which is in the back of this telescope at the end here, is six inches across. So you can think of how big. Hubble really is. That's a that's big. That's a big mirror, and it's especially a big mirror to be putting up in space. You know, considering all of the the uh, necessary requirements to put it up there. Um, it, you know, building it on 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 Earth and on land is one thing, but putting it up into space is was a huge undertaking. 
Um, so it, it, and a phenomenal feat ultimately. Um, so in, in terms of telescopes then themselves, uh, just for reference for people, so there are a number of um, very large telescopes um, on, on the earth itself. A number of them are uh, used extensively. And when I'm talking about these telescopes, I am literally talking about optical telescopes. So, so op optical and radio and, well, other frequencies, but mostly optical and radio um, telescopes have a particular uh, size category. Uh, so the largest optical uh, telescope category on Earth at the moment is somewhere between 8 and 10 meter. So there's a few 10 meters and a few 8 meters. So the VLT, um, the, the Geminis on Hawaii and so on. So the, there are a couple of, uh, um, and, and the, the European Southern Observatory have the VLTs. Um, so they're, they're eight to 10 meter class uh, telescopes. And they can, they can see pretty close to the edge of the known universe. Uh, so they're, they're pretty high powered uh, instrument systems. Um, the European Southern Observatory is there also currently building a, a 42 meter. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a 40 meter class. We'll put it as a 40 meter class because it, it, it's a segmented system. So what they do is they use a, a hexagon of one meter, well, one to one and a half meter size hexagons uh, and they put it all together to create the mirror. So it's not quite a circular system. Yeah, so it's like um, smaller but, mirrors patched together to make one, because like this one's one yeah. solid mirror. But exactly. So yeah. it's smaller mirrors patched together to make one giant large mirror. Exactly, and, and they use lasers then to align the mirrors to make sure everything is, is focusing properly. Yeah, because those have to be perfect. Yeah, it has to be perfect. It has to be, it has to be nanometer uh, perfect uh, because it's optical light. So optical light is, is on a nanometer scale, so uh, it, it has to be extremely well aligned. Um, and they, they use another system called adaptive optics to, to, to slightly f move the mirrors uh, in order to, to, to refocus if they need to. In fact, so, some systems ha actually have a fake star uh, system for, for optical aligning. Um, so, so they use a green laser because green is good at exciting the atmosphere at a certain height. Uh, so you can actually create a fake star with a green laser system. Uh, so some telescope sites actually do that, um, which is which I, I find very interesting. Um, so like so the telescope system itself, uh, from a Hubble point of view, it's it's known as a Ritchie Crescent. Uh, so there are a number of different types of telescopes. Most people would be familiar with, with what I have behind me here, okay, which is um, a more of a Galileo type system. So it, it's, it's all uh, lenses. There's no mirrors involved in this system. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that's your standard type uh, small telescope. Once you start to get up in size, lenses don't cut it anymore. They, they get, they deform uh, uh, under their own weight, uh, so to speak, and because you can't support them from underneath. Um, so you, you so you, you end up going towards um, mirrors, uh, so reflective telescope systems. So, it's so, re this, so that's exactly, your, those are your two Which is exactly what you have behind you, yes. Yeah. So um, your refractor telescopes and then your opposite, the Newtonian style, this would be the re reflector telescope that I have. Absolutely. Um, so the, the Newtonian reflector system, which is a curved, one curved mirror and one flat mirror, um, you know, as as the name obviously suggests, was designed by a certain individual. Um, so that so that works, and that gives you a certain um, a certain magnification, but also it is prone to uh, some error. Uh, so it doesn't give you a perfect image across the entire uh, your entire field. So if if you're looking at it, it's good in the center, but it kind of it worsens the, the further you go away from the center. Yep. So what you want to do is you want to redesign it. So uh, Cassegrain came up with a different system. 
um, the, so we, which is two curved mirrors. And the curved, the secondary mirror puts it the light back to the center of the, the primary mirror. Okay, so it, it's kind of like a double reflection system, but down back through the center of the primary mirror. Uh, and then after that, uh, Richie Creshin, which are two individuals, came up with a separate design, which improves. It is just simply an extension of the Smith Cassegrain design, um, which me, which is infinitely better well not infinitely better but significantly better than the schmidt cassegrain design in terms of the errors you get away from the center of your image mm -hmm. so the hubble telescope is a rich accretion so it's from an optical point of view it's actually an extremely efficient design and if i can just jump in here the, the reason that's so important to have um have as much as little as error as possible on your mirror is so that you have better data because if you have really bad air, margins of error on your edges then those are all areas that you can't really use the data from that's not very good you need all the stuff from the center so the wider that space is the more opportunity it gives you for better data right? absolutely yeah um that, that that's exactly it um so uh, so when, when so at, at Black Rock Castle Observatory, what we do is is we look at uh, supermassive black holes in particular. We look at quasars. Uh, you want to say what kind of telescope we work on there? Yeah, so ours is a Ritchie Crescent, um, and it's just a, like Hubble, a sixteen inch, so it, it's just shy of half a meter. Um, and we we use a particular type of camera. We might get onto cameras in a, in a in a while uh, if 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 we time, um, but. So what we, the important element is when we look at quasars, we need to have the field from the center all the way out to the edge of the camera as flat and uniform as possible. So that when we're comparing one star with another star that we don't see undue variation or unnecessary variation because of optical elements. So we, we want only the variation to be what's out there in the universe. So we were, because of that, that's all we're interested in. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so, so it is important to get the, the telescope design and the optics as, um, as, as accurate as possible. Um, so the Hubble Space Telescope itself is, uh, as I say, is, is a rich equation, um, which is currently, you know, one of the best designs that one uh, can get. Can get. Um, as I say, it's a 2.4 meter, which is a very nice size. Um, I might share in a couple of minutes uh, just a, a number of the images that, that have come back from uh, Hubble recently, uh, including one or two that may have been released um, today to celebrate it. Um, yeah. So, um, on the journey itself, so Hubble went through a number of stages. So there, there's been five uh, total um, missions that have gone up to Hubble. Um, um, for various reasons, it's been labeled one, two, three, A, three, B, and four, rather than one, two, three, four, five. Uh, whoever makes that call <laughs> make, made that call. That's what it is. Um, but there have been five. So the, the, the final mission was in 2009. And since 2009, it has not really been uh, updated in any way, shape or form other than software. There have been mm -hmm. some software patches uh, uploaded, um, but that's been on a, a, a tenuous level because obviously if they do too much and it, you know, you, it breaks down, uh, given the fact that the space shuttle mission isn't operational anymore, they have limited yeah. ability to actually go physically uh, solve any problems. So uh, it, it's been it's been a reduced uh, capacity in terms of upload and in terms of uh, updates. Um, but in terms of download, in terms of data coming down, it's been absolutely fantastic. It hasn't stopped coming down. It's just continuous. So just just to just to give you a, a quick idea. So Hubble, uh, as I said, relay is to a, a secondary satellite system, which then broadcasts that back down to Earth, down to New Mexico. There's a satellite system in New Mexico, 
uh, which receives the data from, uh, from Hubble. Uh, and they download somewhere in the region of 140 to 160 thereabouts uh, gigabytes of data per day. Mm. So, so it, it stores it on board. It has a solid state uh, storage system. Um, it used to have a tape system, but they've upgraded that, obviously, but one of the, the missions updated that. So they know that's actually device. a good point to bring out because this was you think about the difference in technology 30 years ago versus what we have now and how even just just computers alone how they've developed from 1990 until today and um the the amount of data that they, that hubble is getting and how how that's changed completely mm -hmm. from from now until then so it's it's an interesting point to bring up actually well absolutely i mean you know this was launched in 1994 i mean I know everyone is familiar with the term Google. Google didn't exist in 1994. You know what I mean? So, you know, th th this is this was launched at a time when technology was just coming into was being was it was an infant technology. It was it was just you know coming into its own. Um, it's it's progressed significantly since then, and you know, there's a good argument. Um, in fact. Uh, there are, are a couple of articles which suggest that Google actually, or sorry, Hubble, uh, Hubble played a very particular um, point in a number of technological advances. Uh, so, uh, so Hubble was, and uh, so Hubble has kind of two aspects to it. So there's hardware, which are the cameras and and the and, and the electronics and so on. And then the software. So on the hardware side of things, the Hubble system brought in a new CCD technology, which is currently, and let me turn around, which is currently used in all of these devices. Yeah. It, it, it actually brought the CCD technology on significantly um be, because they did uh, advanced testing on how you um how you attach silicon and or how you modify silicon in order to make uh improved uh photon responses so um so, can, can so, so ccds work on the if you you need to remove um electron capacity and then as the light comes in you get a voltage because you get electrons moving yeah. But Hubble was actually very instrumental in developing that technology in order to, because they obviously have a number of cameras on their system, IR sensitive, uh, visible and ultraviolet sensitive cameras, um, but they all use CCD type technology and they were instrumental in developing that. Sorry, you were going to ask a question. I was going to say, because now that we have CCDs, it, essentially because of that technology, it allows us to have decent quality cameras built right into our phones. Um, but we were talking about this before is that the CCD technology was not really initially designed for that. Uh, well, that, that's absolutely correct. Uh, so the, the CCD technology was actually initially uh, developed as a memory device. Um, and in Bell Labs in, again, it, it was in 1969 in Bell Labs, um, they, um, they were looking for other means of, of using the technology and they noticed that their device, uh, when the lights were on, had extra voltage associated with it. So uh, a particular, uh, they've actually won the Nobel Prize since then, uh, Mr. Boyle, and, uh, or sorry, Dr. Boyle and Dr. Smith um, have won the, the Nobel Prize since, um, realized that it was a, a reaction of the silicon to, to photons and that it could be used as an imaging device. So the CCD itself came about almost accidentally. Yeah. They weren't intending to, to do it that way, but that, that's the way it happened. Um, so, uh, yeah, so they ended up doing, you know, it was just one pixel initially, and then they went to, to you know, three, four, well, they made it in a square, obviously, because that's how it's made. Well, it's made, actually, silicon is made in, mostly in circular format um but but chopped in square format um but so they they ended up 
you know, expanding the number of pixels and sure, now look what we have. We have, you know, an average camera has whatever, 12 megapixel or 20, me whatever. Yeah. Whatever, whatever, depending on the phone you have or depending on the camera that you have. Yeah. But it's in the it's in the megapixel range, that's for sure. Um, and that's all based on, um, yeah, someone noticing uh, on a particular evening in, in Bell Labs in, in America that, yeah, photons, uh, coming photons falling on top of a silicon structure creates voltage and this gives us really amazing images that now because now hubble's using that technology to then be able to produce these incredible images that it's been able to get do you want to show some of those images that you have absolutely um so let me just uh if i can share my screen for a second mm -hmm. so i'm going to show you uh uh, uh it's well it's three images it's four images but it's three so I, i'll explain as i'm going okay. through it um i think it's this one can you see my screen yep i can see it All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to do, just going to reorder it slightly. So I'm going to talk about a couple of images. Um, so I'm going to start with, um, is that full screen? No. Okay. I might need to stop and reshare. Um, so uh, basically what I'm going, Oh, sorry, I mean, your the presentation was full screen, uh, and we could see the the whole thing on the screen. But you weren't um, in the the PowerPoint full screen. Do you know what I mean? That the presentation mode. All uh, right. Okay. Uh, so what I'm going to um, basically what I'm going to talk about is a couple of images that uh, I think are iconic um, for Hubble. Um, because they were, they have been absolutely fantastic. Um, it's not allowing me to share that now anymore for some reason. You see these images everywhere too. It's not just like in magazines and things like that that are specifically for cameras and telescopes and, and science related things. You see these images up at, in like offices framed in places, I mean, obviously we had them in schools, um, but you see them all over there because they're gorgeous. Absolutely. Um, so the, the image that's there at the moment is, um, is uh, I presume a lot of people will, will, will be familiar with this. It's, it's, it's the Hubble, it's the ultra deep field image. And you know, people this was a very, very interesting. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, uh, yeah, uh, so th this was a very interesting image when it was taken at the time because, you know, for, for a long time, scientists have, you know, been looking at um, distance and, and literally the, the, the nature um, of, of the telescope itself, um, but also the person who it's named after um, was one of the first to understand the nature of the expansion of the universe. And the fact that the universe in and of itself is quite vast. Mm. Um, now, you, you, we can go back significantly towards uh, Charles Messier and so on in terms of uh, the Messier catalogues and galaxy, you, you, seeing uh, distant galaxies and, and so on. Um, so, you know, we, we can go back in terms of that, but hope th this particular image, what it was showing was if if you hold your 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 thumb up to the sky, right? All of those galaxies and each point in here is pretty much a galaxy. All of those galaxies are within that. So within one thumb, that's all of those galaxies. So and if you think of how many galaxies, if you expand that to the, to you know your three hundred and sixty sphere, yeah how many galaxies there are and, and, 
and this is only looking at it in, in a certain wavelength and it's only looking at it to a certain distance. So, you know, it, it, it really highlighted the fact that there are a massive amount of galaxies out there and a massive amount of stars. And as we now know, thanks to other European Space Agency missions and NASA missions, but other European Space Agency missions, we now know that there are thousands and millions and millions of planets out there as well. So, um, so it, it, it was it was a fundamentally uh, inspirational image. Uh, it, it was produced in the nineties, but it was a fundamentally inspirational image. It's been updated since then, but it was a fundamentally inspirational image. It's um, really interesting to me because this was a, a spot in the sky where they thought there wasn't much of anything to look at, right? So they had pointed sure. the air and said, well, let's just, let's do, let's focus Hubble, Hubble on this little dark spot of the sky. We don't see them, so there's much there anyways. And then this is what came out of it. Yep. So darkest places, this is how much activity, this is how much we can see. That's pretty incredible. Oh, absolutely. Um, so, I mean, it, 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 it it highlights the fact that the universe may seem empty in, you know, predominant areas, but, you know, if there's a lot of activity going on in the universe at the moment. Um, uh, so it, we, what we, what we need to do is continue to develop the instruments uh, and the capacity to be able to understand the universe. Um, and, and there are a couple of reasons for doing that, but we might get up, further into that in, in, in a few moments. So the next image I'm going to show you, so there's two images. So th this is the original. Uh, so this is the, an optical image. Uh, well, it's a combined optical image of the pillars of creation, which Hubble took. Yeah. Um, uh, in, in the early 2000s, uh, if, if a fantastic, a stunning image, an absolutely stunning image. Um, and just for reference, uh, so our, our so, so this is the if you take the pillar on my left, so it could be your right, but it's my left. Um, the, so the largest pillar, basically, uh, if you take that, that that's about four to five light years in in, in height, uh, which is several times larger than our entire solar system. So, you know, it, it's not exactly a small structure. Right. Um, and, but it, then it, it, they took a, a couple of more recent uh, images and, and they took it in the uh, infrared. And so they used the infrared camera. Um, and if you look at this, it's, it's the exact same feature, but there is a lot more star formation than what they had previously anticipated. So all of that dust cloud is actually significantly forming massive stars. So similar to how you know our own sun was formed, um, quite possibly, we don't know, but similar to how our own sun might have been formed, um, this, all this cloud is being gradually twisted and turned and gravitationally spun into a stellar type format and then stars are born uh, and, and that out of stars then you get your explosions and then you get your planetary systems. Uh, so just for reference the, um, the Pillars of Creation is, is in the Eagle Nebula um, which is approximately about 6,000 light years away from us Mm -hmm. uh, so it's in our own galaxy. Uh, so it's just on a different arm, but it's in our own galaxy. Uh, unlike, for example, these particular objects, which are very distant because mm -hmm. they're all different galaxies. Yeah. So, you know, Hubble has that ability to be able to go between, clear, uh, between near to far. Um, and I might show you one more image. Um, really good point. I think a lot of times people do think of it just looking at really deep, um, deep sky images, really deep space images. Um, but yeah, the fact that it has a range is interesting. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so, so this is this was another particular image, and it was a 
particularly of interest to, to, to myself being a being someone who, who looks at quasars. Uh, so so this is a um, this is a supermassive black hole, um, uh, and it's a, it's 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 a it's a phenomenally real image of a supermassive black hole. Um, so at the center you have a supermassive black hole that is uh, four million times the, the the mass of our own sun. So it is huge. It is a massive. 400 million times our sun. Now, if you consider you can fit, well, a let's say a thousand Earths into Jupiter and a thousand Jupiters into the sun, <laughs> you know, you do that. Yeah, it, it, like it, sometimes it's, it's hard to million. even grasp that. Like, it really to even try to think of how big that really is. It's it's hard to really grasp the size of that. It is. It is hard to grasp it because. It, you know, sometimes the brain does actually struggle to, to make these kind of uh, leaps and and and, and computations. Um, but it, it's a huge. I mean, it, it simply to us on an image, it just looks like you know a donut with a spot in the middle. But if you actually, it, this is actually physically real. This thing mm -hmm. exists in space. Yeah. So it, it is a huge, supermassive black hole that is eating. The, the donors that surround it will eventually be eaten into the supermassive black hole itself. So um, by eaten, I mean, it'll fall in, it'll collapse into the actual black hole itself. Um, so it, it, it's, it's a phenomenal um, image to be able to capture that through a space-based telescope such as Hubble and, and it's, it's massive credit to the teams of people that work on Hubble, because there are teams of people that work on them, you know, the, from uh, from the European Space Agency to um, and, and, and across the world, uh, it is phenomenal. I want to yeah. show you just one more quick image. Yeah, I was just going to say we are creeping up on the hour here, and we do have a few questions in the comments that I'd like to get to. So, um, sure. and I know we want to talk a little bit about even just like um, uh, just the final things about some Hubble. So uh, we'll just get to the questions in just a minute here. Sure. Uh, so I wanted to, to, to just uh, give you one final image. So so this is Jupiter. Um, so again, going from the uh, from Hubble's ability to go from far to near. So this is Jupiter. So Jupiter is you know reasonably close in terms of um, universal scale. Yeah. Um, uh, so this uh, so this is Jupiter with with the moon Io. So Io is um, about three and a half thousand kilometers across, mm -hmm. and you can actually see the shadow of Io on Jupiter itself. So that black dot is is a shadow of Io. It's really impressive. It really is. So uh, you know uh, these are the types of images um, that ha have just you know stunned. All of us, um, uh, you know, across the planet. Um, I do want to get onto one, uh, a, a couple of topics, yes. if, if if we have time. Yeah, could I um, give you the questions first, since they just came up here, and then I'll hand it back over to you. Of course, uh, I'm. I'm a... We could. Yeah, okay. So. Um, Interesting here. So we have um, from Rob, Doc, Dr. Smith mentioned space junk in the talk earlier this week. Is Hubble is the Hubble telescope at risk of being struck? Very good question. Uh, yes, um, but to a lesser extent. Uh, so its 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 orbit is is slightly higher. Um, it is within the region of low Earth orbit systems. Um, however, most, um, so I'm assuming they're talking about the likes of Starlink, uh, or SpaceX, OneWeb, that, that, that type thing. If you're mm -hmm. talking about them, then most of those orbits will be slightly lower. Um, however, it still runs the same risk as any other system as being struck by small meteorites or small or other objects that are out there that we don't know of. Uh, so not necessarily yes. 
space junk from stuff that we're putting up there, but actual things from space. Things from space, absolutely. Yep, uh, it runs the same risk. Yep, for sure. I mean, it's it's two point four meters in diameter, but it, it, it's 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 ten meters long, so to speak, or there thereabouts. So you know, it's not exactly a small structure. It's the no. the size of a of a, a bus type thing. Yeah. Um, and, and, and it has solar panels, which it uses to obviously um, get ele electricity from the sun. Um, so they're obviously, you know, they could be struck by something. So yes, absolutely, it, it could be. Hopefully, the, uh, you know, we're in discussions, uh, not me personally, but um, as a community, uh, we're discussing uh, with the likes of SpaceX, the uh, capacity and the ability to organize orbits so that, you know, they're less likely to happen. Yeah. Um, because that, that's an important, that's absolutely a very important feature. Uh, we, we need, when we're, if we're launching 12,000 satellites, we need to know where they're orbiting and when they're doing what they're doing uh, so that, you know, if if a, if a system like Hubble needs to move out of the way or needs to shift itself slightly, then it can do so. Yeah, I mean, imagine if something happened to Hubble where it wasn't able to take those images that it's been able to take if, because it was struck by something that we put up there. It'd be devastating. It'd be horrible. And oh, absolutely. So we have one another question here. Can we see uh, the Hubble Space Telescope with the naked eye? Uh, not particularly, no. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's sufficiently faint that it's not really easily uh, viewable with the naked eye. Um, it, it, it's even quite tricky to, to get it with a telescope, to be honest. Uh, it's quite low in magnitude because it, it's, it's constantly pointing uh, towards the sun rather than uh, towards the earth. So, uh, so it, its solar panels are pointed at the sun, not at earth. So, uh, really how so, we see so all of the reflectivity is, is away yeah. from Earth, so to speak. Right. Uh, so it's, it's not a particularly easy thing to see. Uh, it, it is technically achievable with, with a telescope, but it's, it's tricky. Yeah, definitely. Uh, okay, I'll turn it back over to you. So there are a few more topics you wanted to just get into before we wrap up here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so um, I, what I wanted to talk about was, was the, the, the benefits of Hubble itself and, and you know, so there, there's two elements of, of this. So, so there are scientific benefits from an astronomical point of view, um, and there are also benefits to general society, mm -hmm. um, which I think are very important. So uh, the Hubble itself has played a significant role in a number of discoveries on an, astro uh, on an astronomy side of things. So the age of the universe, for example, it has uh, been very important in getting a, a reasonably accurate calculation on the age of the universe, as well as, um, you know, as I say, as I've just shown, black holes and, 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 and so on, uh, but also in terms of mass and gravitational waving, it has also played a, a very important element in the scientific community uh, in being able to look at uh, gravitational lensing, gravitational waves. Um, so, you know, we'll see where, where, where that goes. The next generation of telescopes. Um, so the James Webb telescope, uh, which is uh, going to be launched uh, hopefully in approximately 2025. Um, mm -hmm. Will will so that that's got that's a six meter class telescope. So that's I'm I'm very excited. <laughs> well, that's a six meter cool. class space telescope. But that's going to give us the replacement for essentially the replacement for Hubble. So the next instead of like going up there and continuing to repair Hubble, it's to send something with all the new technology on it, even larger, and use all even the things larger, we need yeah. Hubble with that larger cameras larger mirror larger optical system improved optical system yeah i'm i'm, I'm very excited as to the type of images that that's going to actually give us back i think they're going to be mind-blowing um yeah. Yeah, from a from an astrophotography point of view but also from a from a science point of view i think it'll, it'll be absolutely 
fantastic. Um, but I also wanted to mention just a, 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 a couple of things on what Hubble has done um, on Earth. So the Hubble-based system, um, there's a couple of technological issues that Hubble had to solve. Um, hardware in particular, as I said, the CCD um, it being one of them, which is now obviously in deployment across millions and millions of devices across the planet. Um, but it also had to uh, solve a couple of uh, software issues uh, and image analysis in particular. So all of these, if remember I said, uh, or previously, you know, the, the, there's 140 gigabytes of images coming down every day. Mm -hmm. So all of those images have to be analyzed. Yeah. So what they have to do is they have to develop a technique to analyze those images as efficiently as possible. Could, could you imagine doing it by yourself? Like if a human had to go through all that? Um, it would take more than one human. Yeah. <laughs> sure. It's a lot um, of- Yeah, it, 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 that, that, would, that would take quite some time. That would yeah. take quite some time. Yeah. Um, so what, what, what they've, what they put together, um, and, and this was at the, J, the, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory uh, in particular uh, at JPL, uh, is they, they, they formed a, a, an imaging analysis system that has now been uh, redeployed for a couple of things, actually. Um, it's been used for uh, genome sequencing uh, mm -hmm. because it's, it's very good at um, differentiating uh, between um, color bands, um, but also it, it's been used uh, for the CCD side of things uh, in uh, biopsy uh, cancer treatment systems. That's uh, interesting. So, so the so the camera system itself, uh, with the software, is used um, to develop a new technique of doing a biopsy. So instead of having to do a surgery, it's now a keyhole system. So, Amazing. you know, so there's less pain, there's less risk of infection. Yeah. Um, you know, the, 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 uh, the patient doesn't have to go through as much pain and all that kind of stuff. So uh, it's been very important um, in, in developing that. And, and that was directly from the Hubble system. It's, it's interesting because a lot of times you hear that argument um, of like, why do you spend so much money sending a telescope up into space or doing space mission, things like that. But there, there are things that branch off. There are technologies that branch off of the technologies that are being used and the problems that are being solved um, through doing missions like this. So it's really interesting to see that sort of an application. You wouldn't think initially 30 years ago, if that wouldn't have been an argument to launch a telescope into space. Like, hey guys, we're, we're gonna be able to do some real achievements here in medicine. <laughs> How did that connection wasn't able to be made. So um, it's really interesting to see that kind of a, a technological advancement coming right from uh, Absolutely. Hubble. Absolutely, um, and 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 uh, I know one of one of the more recent ones was it, it was able to. Um, um, they used the image image processing software to um, extract information from a uh, a papyrus that they found uh, in the Middle East. So they couldn't they couldn't read the the lettering um, on it, um, but but using the image um, analysis techniques that Hubble use, um, they were able to uh, extract the uh, the lettering um, from the background, so they were able to read it. So yeah, uh, you know, uh, again, that's you know that's important in some fields, but not necessarily in every field. Yeah. But um, and I do know just a, in in a, in a lighter tone. And they used uh, techniques that were used to grind the mirror mm. of um, of the Hubble. They used uh, similar techniques to grind uh, the skates of Olympic athletes uh, ice um, ice skating. Huh. So yeah. Really, I never heard that before. That's interesting. Yeah. So really? you know, again, not exactly. You know. In, in, in comparison to medical technology, not exactly the same level, but still very important because, you know, people need to make livings, people need to, you know, ice skating is, is a phenomenon all, all over the planet. So yeah. if there's a new technique that can help you improve your ice skating, then, uh, and, and Hubble uh, played a part in, in achieving that, then fantastic. 
Um, yeah. But it's all about getting the techniques and, and improving your understanding of how to how to clean your slate, how to clean the blade of your skate and so on. So, um, and, and yeah, so it, it, it played a part in, in apparently one of the Olympic winners, gold medalists in, in recent times. Hmm. Use a hobble technique, so. That's really interesting. Um, well, um, we are, we're, we're right about at the hour mark here for the, the stream, so. Um, did you have anything, any final say, any final word that you wanted to get out or a, a final topic you wanted to address before uh, before we end this, the live stream here? Um, well, uh, ultimately what I, I wanted to just conclude by saying the, so Hubble itself has been um, and will continue to be an absolutely fantastic mission. I mean, it's, it's been in operation for 30 years and it's, it's due to be in operation for possibly another five to 10 years. Uh, so it's going to continue to, to acquire uh, significant data. It's been an absolute phenomenon in terms of acquiring both scientific data and inspirational data. Yes, definitely. So, you know, it's been an inspiration to, to, to the world. If you look at some of the images that it's taken, it's been an absolute inspiration. And, and, and I know that there are teams of people working behind the scenes in generating those images, uh, as in taking the raw data, because Hubble, don't forget, is, is a monochrome camera. Mm -hmm. It's not a color camera. So what you do is you take it in, in several different colors and then you have to layer it together to make your color image. So yeah. there, but it takes teams of people to do that. So, and they've been doing a fantastic job, um, both in uh, both in America, but uh, uh, in particular in Europe as well. So, um, I'm I'm very much looking forward to the next generation of of telescope, the James Webb Telescope, which is also a joint NASA and European Space Agency mission. Yeah, it's going to be. Uh, good. So, um, and actually, I believe the Canadian Space Agency are are, are involved. Um, so that that's going to be a, a fantastic mission. Uh, I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, I am too. It's it really is going to be. I mean, I've as someone that remembers the images starting to come out and starting to be published and being posted. And I mean, these these images made the newspaper in the U.S. when I was growing up as a kid. You know, this is there are not that many images from astronomy that make front page of a newspaper. And I do remember that. And I think um, of, the, of course the recent um, black hole image was something that was all over the place. And that mm -hmm. kind of buzz that was going on about the black hole image. I remember that kind of stuff happening for Hubble when I was growing up. Mm -hmm. So it'll be really interesting to see with the next, um, the next iteration here with the James Webb telescope to see what we get from it. It'll be really exciting. Well, absolutely. Um, and, and I know that there are a number of other telescopes um, proposed for, um, in terms of future missions, proposed for, um, you know, in different frequencies and, and, and in different wavelengths, because that's important, because obviously our atmosphere blocks out an awful lot of light in terms of um, the higher frequency, the, 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 you know, the, the X-ray and the gamma ray, which mm -hmm. is a good thing, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's good that our atmosphere actually protects us from, from all of that uh, nasty type stuff. Um, so, um, but, but nonetheless, we do have a number of, of, of telescopes that are up there that are in, in that frequency range. So combining them with optical infrared and ultraviolet and, you know, getting a, a, a full picture of what the universe is actually like and how the universe is expanding and, and, and so on is, is, is very important because ultimately it, it, it dictates what our future is. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 as a, uh, you know, as a species, you know, it, it, it is, you know, it, it's long term, obviously, it's a very long term system. But at the same time, the only way you get to understand it is by studying it now. The faster mm -hmm. you study it, the more you understand about it. So um, it, it's important to understand the nature of the universe. Yeah, and it'll also be interesting to see the technological advances that come from um, from this telescope. And we've seen already the things that have impacted us from from Hubble. And mm -hmm. that technology is, I kind of it's hard to say it like this, but it's it's, it's an ancient kind of tele, uh, technology. Now, when we think about where we at, where where we are at, so taking something like James Webb that in the moment is going to be incredibly 
advanced, especially compared to the technology that we launched on Hubble. You're talking about having like tape <laughs> recording before. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. So it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see the offshoots of technology that come from what happens with, with James Webb. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, there are possibilities for future telescopes that might be... Um, so uh, the, the, there's a particular technique called in interferometry, which is where you take a, a couple of or a number of telescopes and you kind of combine the light from them. Um, now, it's mostly done in radio, um, but there are a couple of optical systems that do it. Um, you know, you, you could conceive of a number of telescopes or space-based telescopes that, that do something similar, which, um, but, but then that requires communications. So mm -hmm. what, have, what, what you need to get to that point is you need the likes of your Starlinks, you need the likes of commercial-based um, uh, satellite systems to act as points of contact of information. Uh, to be able to, to, to generate all that. Um, if you start doing that, then you have a telescope that's instead of being 6.4 6 meters, you know, or six meters, which is what the James Webb telescope is, you end up a telescope that is effectively 100 meters or a kilometer or 10 kilometers, depending on how far apart the, the systems are. Uh, so um, yeah, lots of possibilities and, um, very much looking forward to seeing how it goes, but I, I, I do think that if, if we combine with what, if we combine what's going on with the Earth observation system, um, which is looking down, and the advances in that with the advances that's going on with uh, the the likes of the James Webb Telescope um, and 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 astronomical observations, if I think if we, if we can combine the ability of those two teams, um, mm -hmm. then you know, I think we're, we, we'll see advances like we've never seen before type thing. It, it's going to be absolutely phenomenal. Um, so you know, I, I don't know what you know, but the tell us that the, the Hubble itself was actually built by Lockheed. Mm -hmm. uh, the mirror was built by a different company. Um, but but, but the, the, the structure itself was built by Lockheed. Uh, so, you know, most of these are outsourced uh, and that's fair enough, you know, yeah. lucky Boeing, there, there's a number of different companies that, that kind of make this type of technology. Um, so, you know, it, so it's not unheard of to have external parties building these types of systems. So if we can combine the private and, and the public sector and, 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 you know, I think we can make a phenomenal uh, telescopic system that will give us insights into the universe like we've never seen before. Uh, yeah, you know, we, we really you hopefully be able to see as far as we can to the edge of the known universe, yeah. uh, which which we've tried, but not quite succeeded. We've gotten close. We're close, but not quite succeeded yet. And, and like you said, we're not that far off from this launch, so it's only a couple of years away. So we're we'll, it'll be really interesting to see. We'll, we'll be around for these discoveries, is what I'm saying. We do not have to wait another 50 years or something, another 30 years for this type of discovery. So um, it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next few years. Absolutely, and and I do think uh, one one element of um, the system is it's it's so it's going to be a system that um, generates quite a lot of data. So, you know, I, I do also think that there could be a number of projects um, for citizens and citizen science projects. So yeah. for people to get involved in actually analyzing or helping to analyze and look at the data. Right. Because there's going to be so much data generated, you know, yeah. if Google or sorry, if Hubble is generating 140 gigabytes per day, the right. James Webb telescope is going to generate a, a, an order of magnitude more than that. It's going to be at least 10 times that, if not more. So, you know, so that's an awful lot of images to be analyzing. Yeah. Uh, and it's going to be high pixel uh, capacity images as well. So I, I do think that there will be a number of projects out there um to to for citizens and for 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 general public to get involved uh, and for students and so on to get involved and actually look at these uh, images and analyze them and and send back their data to us because you know the the images themselves will be quite large but at the same time manageable on a on a local level 
if we if they're distributed right. So I, I you know I would certainly say keep keep an eye on um, both um, Blackrock Castle Observatory website and on the European Space Agency website yeah. in terms of of, of seeing uh, so some citizen science projects that might come come to fore. Definitely. Well, thank you so much, Alan, for doing this. Your first live stream, right? Correct. Did you like it? I loved it. <laughs> okay, then uh, you heard it here first. We might have Alan back for another live stream. <laughs> so uh, happy Hubble 30th to everyone. Thank you for tuning in. We had a lot of uh, good viewers and some good questions here. And like Alan mentioned before, check out our website for more information at bco.ie. And um, the if you're looking for more Dark Skies Week activities, we have some um, good activities on our website at the moment too, and more information about Hubble as well. So um, after the live stream is over, if you think of a question that you didn't get to ask here and you still want to ask us, the, the video will be will still be here on our channel. So you can comment in the sec comment section down below and leave your questions there. And we'll get back to you. We'll, we'll give you answers in the comment section. So thanks everyone for joining us. And um, we hope everyone enjoys our Hubble 30th celebration. Thanks for watching. And thank you so much, Alan. Thank you very much. Sure. We'll see you soon.